Well, now on Radio 4, Richard Herring returns with a brand new series in which he examines an object that has been the cause of controversy. This week, the gollywog. <laughs> It's Richard Herring's objective, and please welcome Richard Herring. Thank you very much. It's good to be back here. Hello, and welcome to the first in a new series of Richard Herring's Objective, the show where I take an object that has become a hot potato, a beef, a bone of contention, and a laughing stock, and try and mix all that up to turn it into a delicious and palatable soup. It's uh, not suitable for vegetarians or people who can't stomach metaphors. I'm turning a taboo list into a to-do list. I'm changing a brouhaha into a ooh-ha-ha. -ha. I'm making them aligned, redefined. I'm seeing if it's possible to reclaim objects with unpleasant associations. As always, I'll be assisted by a woman who has genuinely played the kazoo in front of a paying audience at the Royal Albert Hall. It's TV's Emma Kennedy! Okay. You think the kazoo is an object we could reclaim one week? I don't. Well, not unless sort of incessant droning and unattractive spittle suddenly come back into fashion. No, I don't. Well, we've got you on the show, so, um... <laughs> Uh, enough small talk. Let's see what object we're going to be objective about this week. The Gollywog. Oh, my God, TV's Emma Kennedy. What were you thinking? How, how dare you say that word? It was in the script. That is hardly an excuse. That word is so offensive that the BBC actually sacked a presenter for saying it off air. And here you are merrily shouting it on Radio 4 at 6.33pm. Apologise. I've done nothing wrong. I'm, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Emma's very old. She's in her 50s now. She was... <laughs> She was brought up in another era. She'll be removed from the premises forthwith. Guards, take no, her away no. and deal with her. Gavin, don't. It's awful. <laughs> I've covered some contentious items in this show, the Hitler moustache, the CU Jimmy hats, but when it comes to whipping up controversy, panic and hysteria, it's harder to think of something as incendiary as the gollywog. Oh, no! Damn, now, I, now I've said gollywog. Damn, I, I said it again. Guards, take me away. This is political correctness gone mad. The BBC would like to apologise for any offence that the language on Richard Herring's objective may have caused. And we'd like to make it very clear that we will discipline and sack anyone who uses the word gollywog. <laughs> you idiot! Did you say gollywog? Oh. Stop saying gollywog! Oh, you said it way too many times now. An apology will not suffice. There's only one honourable way out of this. Initiate self-destruct mode. The BBC will self-destruct in 15 seconds. I suppose I can tell you now. We've been working together as continuity announcers for years. I've, I've always loved you. Really? Oh, um, I don't love you at all. I mean, I don't even like you very much, so... Oh, it's mm. a bit embarrassing. Awkward. Well, it's OK. The BBC is about to explode. Phew. Nah, it's all right. We're only kidding. We don't really have to blow up the BBC just because someone said gollywog. Shut it! <laughs> You're allowed to say the word, right? It's not OK to call a person a gollywog. That's the thing. Even then, the only way the BBC will sack you is if you refuse to apologise and you're a bit weird and unpopular already and if everyone hates your mum. Uh, my mum, so it's fine. Barbara Herring, she's great. Uh, hello, mum. She is brilliant. Uh, she did once order the Navy to blow up a warship that was heading out of an exclusion zone, but apart from that, <laughs> spotless record for Babs. Come on, you can't hold grudges. These days, people prefer you to call it a golly. Uh, the wog is silent, <laughs> like our shame <laughs> and our apologies. When we were kids, the golly seemed like a harmless toy. Then things changed. It became this uh, supposedly racist thing, been consigned to the dustbin of history. So is it something we want to reclaim? Is it worth having a go? I have a golly here. It's not mine. It cost £8.15, including package and postage on eBay. The BBC bought this with your licence fee. <laughs> It does feel strange and horrible and anachronistic to be holding a golly in my hands. He's an odd little creature some younger people may not know about these. He's a smartly dressed in a blue jacket, yellow stripy trousers, a red waistcoat topped off with a yellow bow tie. He's got a mop of black hair, two kind of strange white eyes spaced way too far apart, and a grinning mouth that if he had any ears would stretch from ear to ear. But he doesn't have any ears. <laughs> or a nose. It's a cuddly toy of a sinister man leering at you whilst wearing a mask. 
It is utterly terrifying. Just on that level alone, it's incredible these were ever given to children. 40 years ago, when I was growing up, gollies were everywhere, in toy shops, on jam jars. You could send labels off to collect gollywog brooches. The black and white minstrel show was still on until 1978. Agnetha, the pretty blonde one from ABBA, even released this song. For some reason, that wasn't included on the soundtrack to Mamma Mia. <laughs> Though it is on Mammy Mia, funnily enough. But, um... <laughs> Even whilst trying to be objective, the associations this item has does make me feel uncomfortable. But am I being oversensitive? We went out to the streets of London to find out what people made of him and asked them if it was offensive or harmless. Probably not politically PC these days, but it's just a harmless toy. I used to have one as a child, but those days no one thought anything of it. There wasn't the colour population over here in those days, but I must admit, looking at it now, it looks offensive. Well, it's not offensive. It's to their own. As a black person, I don't see why not. I've kept all my Enid Blyton books, so my children don't know it as anything other than what's in a book. It's what I was brought up with. I don't see myself as racist, and I don't see, you know, in that sense that it is. I think the Gollywog is incredibly offensive to some people. It just reflects a horrible attitude historically, and that word that's the end of the word Gollywog is used as a horribly offensive thing to say to people. So if that was fat, I'm fat. If that was fat... All fat people should be offended. No, but, no, but have we been told... If that was, if that was a portly teddy bear, all portly all people should be offended. <laughs> well, you know, so I think it'd be too sensitive. If families wanted children to have some, then maybe there might be a special shop or something, but not to be publicly, you know. So they have, they've got a choice if they want to buy one for their kids or whatever, then they can go to that shop, maybe. That's an amazing solution, and that's a good idea. A special shop. It'd be like in the sex shops you used to get. You'll see people going into them. <laughs> They're going to the gollywog shop. I wonder what they could be buying today. <laughs> I was surprised. I actually thought everyone would be upset by it, but it was, you know, the vast majority of people we spoke to uh, seem to think that the golly is just a toy. They had them as kids, uh, and that it's no need to be offended. But is that to ignore the history of this doll? To find out how the golly came into being, I went to talk to Catherine Howell, the collections manager at the Museum of Childhood at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, who told me that the character was actually created by Florence Upton in a series of books in the 1890s. They were the must-have books of their time, um, and basically Florence and her mother worked on them. Um, and the golly, or gollywog as he was originally in the story, was the hero, the main character of these books. And he then became a very much loved character and with toy spin-offs and things like that afterwards. Do you know how they came up with this idea? Was it based on something they had already seen or did they create it from scratch? Um, Florence actually based the golly on an old toy that she had. Um, she was actually brought up in the States and acquired this doll who was must have come from the sort of minstrel tradition. But she put it together with some old Dutch dolls that she had, so she developed this idea of turning her toys into characters for a book. Uh, the original Gollywog in the books is quite an heroic figure whose inner goodness shines through. Sir Kenneth Clark of Civilization fame remarked of the books. I do not think it is an exaggeration to say that they influence my character more fundamentally than anything I have read since. He was for me an example of chivalry, far more persuasive than the unconvincing knights of Arthurian legend. I identified myself with him completely and have never ceased to do so. Also, he's a black man hanging around with four white women, which uh, is quite a progressive idea for the 1890s, but <laughs> then the dolls are Dutch. They've always been a lot more liberal about that kind of thing. <laughs> I talked to Catherine about where the name originated. She claims that she made up the name completely, and I mean, you believe that story because that's what she said. She says the name popped into her head. There have been various ideas about where it came from. The most likely one is that it's very like Pollywog. Pollywog is a name for a tadpole, and it's just a kind of a silly name that children would remember. But actually, we don't have any idea where the name came from. <laughs> So the name is a nonsense word that took on unpleasant connotations later on, which isn't Upton's fault, but the original doll it is a caricature of a black person. It's dressed as a minstrel, which is an archaic entertainment where white people put on blackface, often to lampoon black people as stupid or lazy. It's a doll with an historical context. It's not unlike having a stuffed toy with an exaggerated hook nose, which when you pull a cord in its back says, I control the world's finances. That's... <laughs> If you gave that to a child, they probably wouldn't understand the reference, but would that make it an acceptable toy? I don't... 
I don't think many people would be happy with that, and it's weird because there are plenty of other kind of offensive toys that people stamp down on immediately. There was a bed that Woolworths designed that came out a few years ago called the Lolita bed. <laughs> And everyone at Woolworths had no idea that that was the name of the 12-year-old girl in the Nabokov novel who was seduced by Humbert Humbert, the man with the best name in all of literature. Uh, they should have called the bed the Humbert Humbert bed. No, it no one would have got that, but that was stamped on, no one would have that. There was a doll that did pole dancing. But surely to a child, the child wouldn't know what pole dancing is, that's just a toy. But with that one, I'm sure the people who say it's fine for people to have gollywogs wouldn't like the idea of that. There's terrifying dolls as well. I, I was terrified of Hamble from, <laughs> from play school. Do you remember her? Anyway, I spoke to Catherine at the museum about offensive toys. Well, we have Aunt Sally. People don't like that, you know, throwing sticks at an old lady or whatever. Um, and sometimes the old lady has a black face as well, which, of course, makes it worse. Do you stock the Lolita bed that Woolworths brought out a few years ago? Uh, no, we haven't got that. I think we tried to get one, but they've run out. <laughs> or they've stopped making them. Have you got Hamble from uh, Play School? No, 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 I think it was invented for Play School and there was only one of it. It's terrifying. <laughs> Even if Upton's gollywog was chivalrous, the image of the doll and the character changed considerably over the next half a century, and obviously the name became this unpleasant racial insult. Upton didn't copyright the image of the doll, leading to a huge loss of earnings for her, as others created their own versions of the character, and authors incorporated him into their stories. So who's to blame for this shift? Uh, Catherine Howell has a theory. Well, I would say that Enid Blyton had a lot to do with that. The gollies in her noddy books, the golly who features there, was almost seen as not sort of evil, but kind of bad. He was the bad lad of Toy Town. No, not Enid Blyton. She's the beloved creator of Noddy and the Secret Seven and an opponent of female equality. She's right about everything else. How could she, <laughs> how could she have got this so wrong? How could she be blamed? To find out about that. Will you please welcome my next guest? It's Enid Blyton, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, here she is. Hello, Enid. Uh, lovely to have you on. Uh, hello, Richard. Lovely to be here. It's been a while since I've been allowed to be on the whitelist. Well, some would say that was because you died in 1968. So. <laughs> some would say that, Richard, yes, but then others might say that I've been kept off due to a plot by a cabal of oversensitive liberals and political correctness gone insane. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that you being dead is the main reason. <laughs> That's very convenient. So do you feel you use the golly as a racist stereotype in your books? Of course not. It was more innocent times. It's the modern world that's sick in their head. There's no such thing as racism then. The gollies in my stories were just naughty, cheeky scamps. Like the golly in Here Comes Noddy Again who asks Noddy for help and then steals Noddy's car. That's... <laughs> less scampery and more kind of Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> Just a mischievous imp for anyone to see that as a reference to a black person. It's their minds that are twisted. What about your book, The Three Gollywogs, from 1944? Well, it's a very funny book. Uh, there are three gollywogs, and the amusing thing is, they all look exactly the same, so no one can tell them apart. <laughs> <laughs> Seems a little bit racist. Oh, but... You're the one with the problem, Richard. They're not meant to be black. People. All right, can we just go over the genuine names that you used for those three gollywogs? In all, the... all right, yes. Uh, the first one is called Golly. Right. I, I got the idea for his name from the word gollywog. Uh, yeah, that's just about acceptable. Yes. And the second one, similarly, I took the second part of the word to make woggy. <laughs> yeah, I've got a bit more of a problem with that one. Would, <laughs> would you mind calling him, for the purposes of this interview, could you call him Reggie from uh, now on? But his, his name's... Reggie, his name is Reggie. <laughs> Physical correctness gone mad. To be honest, it really is the name of the third gollywog that is the most problematic for me. The third golly is called Nick. Enid Blyton! <laughs> you cannot use that word on Radio 4 in this. For the rest of this chat, we'll be calling the third gollywog Nigel. <laughs> that is. It was different times. There was nothing racist about that word back then. It meant something different. No, even in 1944, that word meant exactly the same thing it means now. <laughs> Would you mind reading out a passage from the book? This, we're going to substitute the words in it for the ones we've changed it to, but apart yeah. from that, this is absolutely generally from the Three Gollywogs, 1944. Once the three bold Gollywogs, Golly, Reggie and Nigel, decided to go for a walk to Bumblebee Common. Golly wasn't quite ready, so Reggie and Nigel said they'd start off without him, and Golly would catch them up as soon as he could. So off went Reggie and Nigel arm in arm, singing merrily their favourite song, which, as you may guess, was Ten Little Nigel Boys. <laughs> I, mean, I am 
a bit surprised that their favourite song was that, Enid. Given that song is all about black children being killed in elaborate ways, you'd think they wouldn't really have liked that song. They wouldn't have cared for it. And I thought the Gollies weren't meant to be black people. So why would we suddenly imagine that that was their favourite song? We didn't mean anything by it. You can't judge me by today's standard. We all use that word. Get back to your grave, Blyton. You're a weird, unlikable woman writing children's stories about an archaic world with outdated values that never really existed anyway. We don't need you anymore. We've got J.K. Rowling. <laughs> This time you're not coming back. No, not holy water. I'm melting. I'm melting. <laughs> See you in hell, Harry. <laughs> Enid Blyton's been sucked off to, to hell. <laughs> of course, it's not right to blame Enid Blyton alone for this. It's fun, but it's not right. No one cared about this stuff then because the idea that people who weren't white were inferior was so entrenched into people's thinking they didn't even consider the offence or the effects such words and images might have on children's minds. You can tell from the Vox Pops that people are slightly wounded by the idea that their childhood love of their golly might be perceived in hindsight as racist. Is it defensiveness and a wish not to be judged in hindsight that makes people so supportive of that doll still? I had a gollywog. Uh, I was four years old. I wasn't racist. I had a clanger doll too. That didn't make me prejudiced against aliens. Although as an adult, I do hate all aliens. <laughs> especially ones that eat soup. But, uh, how did it feel being a black person growing up in this gollywog obsessed country, seeing gollywogs everywhere? To find out, will you please welcome comedian Arva Vidal? <laughs> Thank you, Arva. Hey. How are you doing? I'm okay, thanks. So, uh, well, let's start with that. How do you, obviously, you grew up in the 1980s in, in Britain. Were, were gollywogs yeah. still everywhere then? Well, I went to boarding school in Sussex. People had these things on their beds, and I had to put up with that. And did you associate them with, did you see it as an image of a black person, or did you see it as a doll yourself at the time? How did it make you feel? Um, I started associating it with a black person when people started calling me a wog. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> You have a routine about it, don't you? Don't yeah, I do, you, I do. Yeah, we I've talk taken about it on stage, and I had this gollywog, and um, it creates quite a reaction. I've taken it on stage in front of black audiences as well, and I remember the first time I took it out before they knew what I was going to do with it. They just looked at me like, "Oh, this had better be funny." <laughs> and, uh, but I do take it around, and I do explain to people that look, it doesn't actually look like a black person; it's a caricature. And an older gentleman saw me doing this routine and got quite upset. And so he went back home and then he wrote to me and he goes, I know what it is. The reason that gollywog you take on stage doesn't look like you is because it's a boy. And uh, <laughs> he went round and he brought me a gollywog, a girl one, in a little dress. <laughs> and do you know what was so offensive? It was the dress, because I would never have been caught dead in it. <laughs> Very ugly. I just find it really strange how people just don't want to let go of it. And in doing the routine, having people write to me about it and stuff, I just think people think it's an attack on their childhood. The first thing they'll say is, I had one, I'm not a racist. You're like, I didn't call you a racist, though. I never said you were, but with hindsight, you might see what it represents. And, you know, people say things and they don't mean anything by it at the time. But once it's explained to you, then I think you should let it go. Well, listen to those Vox Pops. It's kind of interesting because a lot of people were saying before black people were in the country, it didn't seem as bad. And then suddenly it seems bad now, black people are here. It's like it's all right if they don't know. <laughs> it seems worse to me that, that, it was, that it existed before. I mean, it, it, certainly in the 70s, there wasn't really any representation of black people anywhere apart from on Jam Jars and the Black yeah. and White Minstrel Show. Did you feel like, even in the 80s, was that still the case? Where, where were things starting to change? No, it was very bad during the 80s, yeah. especially. I mean, I don't know how it was for kids growing up in London, but I know being at that type of school, having this kind of thing around was absolute hell for me. So do you think the other kids, you know, people say, oh, as a kid, I didn't understand what it was about. Do you think the other kids who had them did understand that as well, obviously, if they were... Uh, yeah, exactly. I keep hearing this thing about kids see no colour. If that's the case, the kids I went to school with were remarkably advanced. They did. <laughs> they know. And people who are adults, anybody who grew up and who's around my age knows what it is. I, because I used one on stage, um, I took it home, and I've got two children myself who were like 14 and 10 then. And when they saw it, they didn't know what it was, because it's an alarming-looking thing. So when they saw it, they burst out laughing, and they were going, Mum, what is that? And I said, it's a gollywog. And they were like, what? I went, has no one ever called either of you two a wog? And they said, no. And I was like, oh. 
Oh, they've missed out on so much. <laughs> Just this week, you've actually been out to a, a protest, a, a shop that's Yeah, them. yesterday I went down to this protest and we had signs saying it was a racist image and stuff, and some people got very, very angry. And one of the things that people repeatedly said to me was, oh, well, we don't call it a gollywog anymore, it's now called a golly. <laughs> like, it's the same thing. <laughs> you know, if I sat down, I drew a picture and it was a swastika and someone goes, Ava, why are you drawing a swastika? And I go, oh, it, it's a sticker. You go, get out of here. <laughs> I even said that one woman went, yeah, I'll let you have that one. Because it's, <laughs> you know, you know what it is. And the emotion that some people attach to it, if they claim it's just a toy, I would never get that emotional over a yo-yo. You know what I mean? <laughs> There was a couple of black people that came down that surprised me. There was two black people that weren't raised in this country, and they said that they had gollywogs and they didn't see anything wrong with it. There was one guy who was from Kenya who said, gosh, haven't you got anything better to do? What, you know, what's your problem? I'm from Kenya. We were all black in Kenya. I didn't even realize I was black till I got to England. <laughs> Wow, I wonder when that happened, probably when he approached immigration. <laughs> I, um, and, and then there was this black guy that came up, and he was the angriest one of all, and he started shouting, going, what's your problem? My girlfriend's white, and for my birthday, each of her parents gave me a gollywog. <laughs> I said, both of them. He goes, yeah, they gave me one each, and I was like, oh my goodness. You know when they brought out your birthday cake, were the candles in shapes of crosses? <laughs> I don't think they like you. It's just crazy, actually crazy. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that with us. Give it up for the fantastic Arthur Vidal, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, it's foolish to judge the people of the past by the standards of the day, uh, but we were being racist, even if we didn't realise it. And the fact we didn't realise it sort of makes it worse, doesn't it? When I was 19 at university, I had something stolen from me, and I used a phrase that I'd used my whole life without thinking about it. I said, someone wogged it. And my friend, Stuart Lee, said, um, actually, Rich, uh, you, uh... <laughs> probably shouldn't use that word, because... <laughs> Some people might see it as racist. And I got defensive and said, don't be stupid. I've never thought of it that way. I'm not racist. It's ridiculous for you to make that connection. You're the racist. But I should have known Stuart Lee is never wrong. <laughs> I could have dubbed my heels in and refused to acknowledge my unknowing error. But instead, I thought about it for a second and realised I was wrong. And I stopped using that word. That's all we have to do. No one's expecting you to go to prison for what you did in the 1970s. We didn't know, but just move on. To hold on to the idea that everything in the past was brilliant and any change of attitude is ridiculous demeans us all. You probably recall what happened to Carol Thatcher in 2009, which I think kind of encapsulates the whole thing. She was on the one show in the green room afterwards. There was a black French tennis player on TV. It's a bit unclear as to what she actually said, but it was something along the lines of... There's a gollywog. Or... He's got hair like a gollywog. Or... Look at the gollywog frog. <laughs> For me, that last one's a bit too clever for Carol Thatcher to have come up with on her own. I don't think she's got the mental capacity to come up with two racial epithets that rhyme as well, but... You never know, if you put enough monkeys with enough typewriters, one of them's going to look like Carol Thatcher. So... Someone overheard this, she got sacked from the show. The next week, coincidentally, we were both guests on Channel 5's The Right Stuff. I was publicising my show, The Headmaster's Son. That was about my dad being my headmaster at school, how awful that was for me. The first thing she said in that interview was... Well, when I was at school, my mum was the Secretary of State for Education, so I think that's a bit worse, isn't it? And she got me there, to be frank, but uh, I'll give you that. <laughs> I quite liked her. Like, like me at university, I think she hadn't intended to offend anyone. She said of Gollygate... 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we're going back a bit towards the old East Germany. We're not really, are we? <laughs> Being asked to apologise for saying Gollywog hardly equates with life under the Stasi. I, I told her, I don't think you should have been sacked. I think you should have apologised. Who should I apologise to? I think a blanket one would probably do. Un <laughs> unless you want to go door to door. But... Uh, <laughs> Rather than sack her, why didn't the one show send her with a film crew down to Brixton or Toxteth and talk to some actual black people, call them gollywogs, see how they responded? I think <laughs> we might have learned something. 
because a lot of people are confused by the changes. It's okay to discuss this stuff. It's actually good to, because there are very simple reasons why calling a black person a gollywog isn't right. But she said... It's political correctness gone mad. It's not political correctness gone mad. It's political correctness gone correct. That is... <laughs> political correctness, all that is, is just politeness. That's what it is. It's showing people respect, unless they've done something to deserve your disrespect. It's like I wouldn't have said to Carol Thatcher, what's up with your voice? Because that would have been rude. I, I said to her, there's certain words it's not acceptable to use in that way anymore. And she looked a bit astonished. I don't think anyone had said this to her face. I actually got a round of applause from the crazy people who go and watch the right stuff live. <laughs> an achievement. But, you know, I'm thinking in a way I feel a bit sorry for Carol Thatcher. And, you know what, have I been any better? Is it okay for me to say those things I've said in that little bit about Carol Thatcher just because she said things? There is a point where we have to let that go. But I think the golly can be reclaimed in a way. It's a symbol of what this country used to be and the mistakes we made. But in a way, it's also a symbol of how far we've progressed away from that. We don't have to ban the golly. That just gives ammunition to the people who want to believe modern-day Britain is like 1950s East Germany. You can have a gollywog if you want but hopefully we're mature enough to put away such childish things given they cause unnecessary offence to people. In any case, destroying all gollywogs doesn't send out a great message. I mean, a, a bonfire of gollywogs could be seen in two ways. <laughs> I think that actually trying to pretend this stuff didn't exist or happen lets us all off the hook for our past crimes. It's part of our history, what happened. We need to keep the golly as a reminder, and it belongs in a museum. Literally. And back at the Museum of Childhood, I finally came face to face with Florence Upton's original Gollywog. So, here's the original Golly, or Gollywog as he was known to Florence Upton. Wow. He's a bit smaller than I imagined him being, actually. That kind of makes him less intimidating. <laughs> He has a nose, which is unusual for gollies, I think, or certainly modern gollies. Uh, button eyes and a fairly in proportion mouth. In the books, he's actually made to look bigger than the dolls, right, but yeah. in fact, he's in, in real life, he wasn't. I think I read that she said it, she kind of got the idea initially because they used to throw things at the doll. The brothers and sisters maybe used to use this doll as a sort of bit of a punch bag and she felt sorry for it because he was a bit of an outsider. Is that right? There is something about her, yeah, her brother's kind of uh, mistreating the doll yeah. and so she thought she'd make him a bit of a hero instead. I expected to sort of hate that original Gollywog, but I felt sorry for him. There was a sense of vulnerable dignity that I hadn't anticipated in him. Upton had intended Gollywog as a hero. Perhaps she'd hoped to change minds. When critics wondered... How anything so hideous should please and even fascinate children... Upton responded... I agree he's ugly. Children see his beautiful personality. In a way, Upton had done what I've been attempting to do with this series. She took a somewhat despicable item, tried to reclaim it as something new and positive. It didn't work. It completely backfired. <laughs> like this show, it was in many ways misguided, but... I respected the gollywog. He represents anyone who has had to fight against prejudice, bullying and defamation, but he definitely belongs there in that museum. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Good night. You have been listening to Richard Herring's Objective, written by and starring Richard Herring with Ava Vidal and me, TV's Emma Kennedy. The producer was Lucia Galani.